And there is no transition going on in the energy markets. It's just not visible in the data. So I'm, in my world also, data, data matters. And the idea that we're in the middle of a, an accelerating transition is not showing up in the data. And in fact, if we then go one step further and talk about aspirations, which is the aspiration, uh, that's when you get to the delusion. My guest today is Mark Mills. Mark is a physicist, senior fellow with the Manhattan Institute, and was named Energy Writer of the Year by the American Energy Society. He has written several award-winning books, including his latest, The Cloud Revolution, how the convergence of new technologies will unleash the next economic boom and a roaring 2020s. The Biden administration plans to eliminate fossil fuels as a form of energy generation in the U.S. by 2035. Not so, says Mark. I recently sat down with him and he shared with me why the administration's transition to green energy is a delusion, in fact, impossible. And here we are going to need fossil fuel for at least the next several decades. Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. This is your second time. I remember the first time you came on was about a year ago or so. It seems pretty, it uh, seems like yesterday. Yeah, it's our anniversary. anniversary. Gonna have to, gonna have to, we're gonna have to get a, a cake. What's the first anniversary? What is right. that? Uh... I think paper or <laughs> yeah. something. I don't know. Okay. I know. You didn't send me any flowers, uh, I didn't get any chocolates. Uh, I got nothing. I got bupkis. Well, wait, wait till after. <laughs> wait till after the show. Um, all right. So uh, you were on the show about a year ago, and you totally enlightened me as to uh, fossil fuels, uh, EVs, green energy. And I remember at the time you just went through, because uh, you just went right through it, how green energy isn't so green or clean, especially when we talk about electric vehicles. So before we even begin, before we even begin, I want to bring you back to the State of the Union address. President <laughs> Biden is giving the State of the Union, it was February 7th, so not too long ago. And he goes totally off script. It's not on the transcript. It's not anywhere. And he says, we are still going to need oil and gas for a while. And then he tells a little anecdote. An oil executive asked him why his company, why his company should invest in fossil fuel projects in light of the negative business atmosphere for oil and gas projects. And Biden responded, we're going to need oil for at least another decade and beyond. You coined this a while ago, the energy transition delusion. Tell me why. <laughs> well, in, in the world that, that I live in, and this is not universal, not universal, uh, I like to believe words have meaning. So... <laughs> I sort of start. Let's start with, and I and I recognize that words are elastic, and we 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 change their meanings over time. But usually, it takes a long time. So a transition means going from something from one place to another. It's a transition, and there is no transition going on in the energy markets. It's just not visible in the data. So I'm, in my world, also data data matters, and the idea that we're in the middle of a, an accelerating transition is not showing up in the data. And in fact. If we then go one step further and talk about aspirations, which is the aspiration, uh, that's when you get to the delusion. It's it's not just that it's delusional to call this a transition because there isn't one. And to restate what I, what I mean by that is we're 20 years into the what we could call the era of climate awareness, at least 20 years into it. The Western world has spent directly about $5 trillion, and I believe probably indirectly another five trillion. Well, let's say round it up to about $10 trillion to avoid using hydrocarbons over the last 20 years. And the share of the world's energy coming from hydrocarbons has indeed gone down in those 20 years. It's gone down from 86% to 84%. So that doesn't look like a rapid transition after $20 trillion of spending. It doesn't look like a transition. In fact, it's not a transition because over that same time period, the quantity of hydrocarbons consumed in absolute terms has gone up. And to put it in sort of relative terms, it's gone up by a quantity equal to adding five or six Saudi Arabia's worth of oil production in terms of energy equivalents. So that's the world's using more of everything. So that's not a transition. That's a, I feel like, you know, the better word would be transformation. We've, we're adding new form of energy to the broad energy mix, which is a lot of windmills and solar arrays. This is true. Uh, we're adding new kinds of machines like electric vehicles. This is also indisputably true. And then we're going to add lots more of them. But 
that's not a transition. In fact, all of history, the development of new ways of producing and delivering energy to society have been additive. In fact, there's a sort of a last point that I made many times I should make again. It's not that I I'm I like windmills. I've been in wind farms that stretch the horizon in China. I think they're impressive. I like solar arrays. In a way, my first patent was a solar device. It actually was a photo detector for guiding missiles. But I was in I was a cold warrior back in the day. So I like I like the technology. I, I think I understand the technology. I'm a fan of the technology. If I were making a prediction today, I would say that the share of the world's energy coming from wind and solar in the coming decade will at least double. At least. We're gonna setting aside all the money being thrown at it foolishly, even without that, we're going to increase the use of it because it's it's more cost effective than it ever was. So it has, a, has an enormous role, really important. But here we are today, as my, to make the point again, all this excitement about wind and solar. And as of right now, after trillions of spending, wind and solar combined provide the world one third as much energy as burning wood globally, burning wood. Wood is the oldest energy source known to man. We still get triple the energy globally from burning wood than we do from wind and solar combined. That's not because wind and solar won't take over wood. It has in America finally. <laughs> so we now we now we now get twice twice or three times more energy from wind and solar than we do from burning wood. But but it just takes time. It costs a lot of money. So the point the point of the delusion language is not um meant to be an invective, although I guess it's obviously provocative. Uh it's that it's not it's not there in the data where we are. And the more difficult thing to answer is, well, why why can't we get there? I mean, so we heard it from the president. The president, uh, in a in a, I guess you could call it a form of social Tourette's, maybe. I mean, I'm not sure why why Trump had social Tourette's even more epically than this president. Uh, when any president goes off script, so he said something that he he has to know is true. And his energy secretary has since he said that off script remark, been running around the country repeating that statement, and actually went to. The biggest energy conference in the world is Sierra Week that uh, my my friends Dan Jurgen, you know, pioneered and created down in Houston, and it brings people from all over the world and all all forms of energy, not just oil and gas. She went there, Secretary of Energy, said again, "We're going to need oil and gas for a long time yet," and she sort of modified that, not just ten years. When the reason she modified it with sort of more open ended, uh, how long we'll need it, is obvious. I mean, if you thought. If you thought as a business, pretend it's your money, that you have to make multi-billion dollar investments today and the government is going to ban your product in 10 years, would would you make those investments? Well, of course not. And of course, the current level of investing in oil and gas is at a epic, if cyclical low, maybe lower than in relative terms than it's ever been in modern modern history. And why 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 are the investments down? Is it because the oil and gas industry is afraid of competition? I don't think they're afraid of competition. They're, what they're afraid of is regulation and taxation. Uh, and so you slow down and wait to see when things calm down. I'm being simplistic. There are lots of factors. But you know, if you're on a board and you're sort of thinking about these things, you know, you're making a lot of money now at current prices, even if even at current softened prices. What's the hurry? Let's just wait and see how things settle out. Let's see what if they're serious. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I would. This, by the way, this this is already the same phenomenon is already in play now in utility scale wind and solar, where uh, investments are down uh, as subsidies get complicated. Nobody knows what the rules are as in uh, as real costs have risen, both for the costs of the machines uh, and as the financing costs have risen mm -hmm. because of interest rates, and as uncertainties have risen with respect to if you're the developer. Going to put billions to work, you might you might begin to worry about the tolerance of markets to high cost energy, and one of the things that is sort of central to the trope of the energy transition is that wind and solar are cheaper. That's just central to the thesis. It's baked into every forecast, and yet there is no jurisdiction in the world, in Europe or United States, no state and no country, in which the increased penetration of wind and solar has led to reduced utility grid costs that have all been associated with higher costs. Yeah, yeah. So if they're cheaper and we're at epic levels of spending, I'm, I'm waiting for the cheaper power if you're a consumer and the inverse has happened. So I think, you know, 
cooler minds setting aside the hyperbole around all this stuff and the anxiety about why we have to do this, which is beyond obvious what the motivations are. Uh, you know, the, the combination of scale imposing real costs, the combination of um, the exposure of the fragility of energy systems that the Ukraine invasion illustrated, because what Europe did was build a more economically and structurally fragile energy system. And by that, I mean both by depending on an unreliable source of cheap energy, but also uh, failing to build in their own borders reliable sources of cheap energy. Right. So all of this, let me, you, you packed up, a, you threw out a lot of great information there. But I just want to go back to one thing that uh, the Biden administration was talking about being going to zero emissions, uh, totally green energy after 2035 <clears throat> or 2050. All those dates really have been thrown out the window. They were just dates probably just to get out there, right? right? It, it, the, the numbers and the, the facts and the data didn't support any of that, right? No, there's no. There's. I think what we have is the Energy Information Administration, which is the Department of Energy's, I mean, tautological information agency, mm -hmm. is pretty is pretty apolitical. They've been very good over the over the decades in providing data based on what's actually happening, as opposed to policy aspirations. Their goal is not to make the policy, but to make forecasts, report data, retrospectively, make forecasts based on stated policy. And they just issued their latest analysis, and they show that pushing out to 2030, 2035, 2040, we don't get anywhere near zero emissions. If you implement everything in the Inflation Reduction Act, set aside the Orwellian name for that, but all mm -hmm. the spending, which is hundreds of billions, literally pro probably direct spending and, and mandated spending, because a lot of these things have mandates that are off-book spending. So there's probably a trillion dollars of spending in the, in the uh, two pieces of legislation, the Infrastructure Act. Inflation Reduction Act on wind, solar, and transmission, and electric cars. And what you get is, you know, something like 15 to 20 percent reduction in U.S. CO2 emissions by 2040 or so, which, okay, I mean, that's not zero, but it's not zero emissions. And more importantly, as the EIA points out and others, this that reduction, which is about a gigaton of carbon dioxide, by the way, we've already gone down about a gigaton of carbon dioxide in the last 20 years mostly because of the cheap shale gas replacing coal, of course. But that's wiped out by a three to four years of increased coal consumption in China alone, never mind India, Indonesia, and other places. So there's, there's sort of this bizarre, um, uh, it's almost surreal ignoring of what's going really going on in the world, which is CO2 emissions are going up as countries expand and chase energy that's cheap. And... The CO2 emissions reductions coming to the United States come at staggering costs and have no effect on the overall global trends. And even, and even Bill Gates uh, at the last um, uh, great gathering that gets vilified <laughs> in at Davos gave a you know private interview and talked about all this stuff. And he and he said, and, and I, I don't think I'm gonna get the quote wrong. He said two things which are important. One is that. Even if we get to zero emissions by 2050, he doesn't think we can. Thinks we have to try, obviously, he says that a lot, but we're not going to. But even if we got there, then that would not mean that the world's warming won't continue. The, the models would show the world will continue to warm roughly as much as the models purport it will do now. Whether, whether you believe the models or not, is not the point. The models don't show any material change going out for the next century after that. Uh, even if we spend that kind of money, the thing that really bothers me, what animates most most of my work, is not it's not just that it's a delusionary to think that we can get rid of hydrocarbons uh, quickly. Not never, never is different than quickly. But quickly meaning in the foreseeable future, in, in decades, is that the cost of doing this is economically and socially destructive. It is, it, in my view, uh, immoral, and it's immoral for this this reason: the whole world has from all and really all of history pursued the goal of increasing wealth for the maximum number of people increasing productivity productivity is always defined very simplistically but 100 percent accurately getting more outputs for fewer inputs of dollars labor and materials the energy transition aspirations get the same outputs if you're lucky with increased inputs of dollars labor and materials 
This is this is it, it put it puts more simply, this is wealth destroying. And at the scales we're talking about, I don't mean having a few percent of electricity from wind and solar and a hundred million electric cars. Those that's irrelevant. It's in the noise, frankly. But the scales imagined, it's profoundly wealth destroying. And the, the people who are impacted by that are, are not the wealthy. So the wealthier are less wealthy. Okay, no one cares. It's it's the wealth destruction of the middle class and the and the people who are who are poor. That's that's it's indescribably offensive to me to have a path that's doing that, which is not the same as saying because it always gets one label as oh well, then you don't care about what we have to try to do. No, I you know I care about changing energy systems. I may not agree with you. Um, it was like, it was the, like the, the hypothetical like you. Here. You know, I haven't met anyone who would say they're pro-pollution, <laughs> they want more pollution in the future. We're, we're all on the no. same side. It's just, as you mentioned, how much it's going to cost and how much benefit are we going to get for each dollar spent? But the mon <clears throat> it's beyond obvious the money matters. and it is, Or symmetrically, follow the money is the old adage about saying who benefits from, from different policies. But, here, but here's the, the problem. It's not only is the rest of the world increasing its carbon dioxide emissions as the West tries to reduce it. Uh, at, at extraordinarily high costs, it's that it's not doing what people claim. I mean, it, it, it's 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 dishonest, intellectually dishonest to pretend, for example, that electric cars are zero emissions. They're not. They're elsewhere emissions. What you'd want to know is how much the emissions are today, and how much they will be in the future as you push harder on getting more EVs in the market to and, and to result in the higher emissions to make the vehicles, obviously it offsets emissions from combusting gasoline. This is beyond obvious and an infantile observation, but it's not zero emissions. Right. It's it's other other place emissions. People know that reflexively when you say it. I mean, they say, okay, yeah, well, I have to have a power plant and everybody jokes about how the power plant could be coal fired. Well, that's no joke. I mean, it depends, it depends on where you charge the car and when you charge the car, how you're filling that battery up. I mean, this may be obvious, but it's, most of the calculations that purport an electric vehicle as zero emissions are based on average emissions from a grid. Well, there's no average, there's no average emissions in filling the vehicle. When the vehicle is fueled is when the emissions occur. So if you fuel the vehicle at night in some parts of the United States, you're filling it with hydro, hydroelectricity yeah, let, let, in other places. Let, let, let me just drill just, just down on this. And so we're, we're, we're on the same page and, and our, our listeners could get this. True, there is nothing, no emissions coming out of the vehicle. But fuel... Yeah, tail, there's no tailpipe. No tailpipe, yeah. so apparently there's not. Yeah. But fueling, by plugging in your EV, you are creating emissions by... Somewhere. <clears throat> electricity, power, making power which doesn't come from magic dust. No. So you would... you would, uh, And the EV, the, the EV focus is important because it's the preoccupation of governments these days, right? We've... We've moved beyond uh, mandating 100% wind and solar. Uh, that's sort of old news, and we we can't get there fast enough. So we, we have the grids that we have. Grids take time to build out. Everybody gets that. Uh, there's lots more wind and solar on grids, depending on where you live. Uh, the most is in Texas. The second most is in the mid-continent of the United States. Lots of windmills. How far that can go is an interesting separate discussion. Uh, and they, they too... Um, don't have tailpipes, so to speak. They don't emit anything when they're operating. They do cause emissions when they get built because windmills are built from concrete and steel, which require metallurgical coal and, and coal and oil and natural gas to make and fabricate. But, you know, measured over the lifetime of, of the operation, it emits less CO2 than burning natural gas. It's true. Um, how much that costs you is is, a, is what matters, not whether that's true or not. But the EV has sort of become the, the monomaniacal preoccupation. I think at last count, I think there's now a dozen states. It might The number may have gone up in the last month. I think uh, state of Maryland, where I live, as governor said, they're going to pledge. Uh, a dozen states that are proposing by 2035 or 2040, depending on the state, to utterly ban the sale of internal combustion engines completely. I think the number of countries that have made such proclamations or plan to make them is now the dozens. So this is all predicated entirely on that these are zero emissions vehicles. That's in, the right. entire predication. I want, you, not, I want you to hang on right there. I want you to hang on right there because when we spoke last time, you you pointed out 
I said, Charles, these cars don't show up in the showroom by magic. <laughs> it took something to get there. <laughs> and you pointed me in the direction of Volkswagen, who had it on their site, which showed yeah. the crossover between an EV and a, I think it was a diesel-powered car. I'm not sure what their thing was. Right. Was, yeah, a, was diesel. Right, close to seven years before before the so, so 70 70 000 miles 70 000 70. miles right which is ten thousand miles a year let's say so yeah. you're talking about yeah. seven years on average seven years before yeah. the ev makes sense in terms of emitting co2 is that more or less right yeah there, there's their study others this they're not alone on this volvo published a similar analysis so what they're doing is they're doing two things they're counting the emissions that's needed to make the ev and its battery and the emissions needed to make the internal combustion engine and so these are these are uh, the noble processes to mine minerals like copper and aluminum, and uh, refine them and assemble them into an electric vehicle. And you do the same with the steel to make an internal combustion engine. So you count that. It's called embodied emissions or embodied uh, energy. It's or body. It, so you count what it takes just to get the vehicle to your driveway. The emissions for that, and. Uh, Everything has emissions associated with manufacturing because hydrocarbons are used everywhere. So that's the world we live in, not the world we aspire to be in in the far future. And then the, then you look, at, in, in the case of both these studies, at the average, back to the average, is the average emissions from the electricity you have available in Europe over the coming five to 10 years to operate the vehicle because the grid that exists is the grid that you're gonna use, not the grid you imagine will exist in the future. And, and, and yes, so what they d determined is that for the first seven years of driving, if you'd driven the diesel vehicle, you would have emitted less CO2 than if you bought the EV, because the combination of the two emissions, the battery being, the mining and the battery being fabricated, and the power plants took you that long to you know pay off your carbon debt. Now, this is important. The Volkswagen study was based on a small EV using a battery less than half the size of a Tesla battery. What was the range of that? So, it was a really small range on that battery, right? It's, yeah, it's a 250 mile range, but it's, you know, for a light vehicle for round town use, uh, which is a lot of people use them for, that's that's fine, perfectly reasonable assumption. But most people aren't buying those vehicles at the moment. The The biggest sellers are the vehicles with the big batteries in the range of three to 400 miles. So, or put it differently, that means you have a battery twice as big, your carbon debt is double. So the the crossover point shifts up from seven years to 10 or 12 years, which for most people, that's never. Now, if you assume that the vehicle has a second life and in its second life, it's emitting less CO2, okay. But the point is the illusion that you as the owner of that vehicle have saved CO2 is totally shattered by those assumptions. Now, here's the, here's the rub. We actually don't know ex exactly how much CO2 is emitted by a specific EV, because we don't know exactly where the materials came from for that EV. We know exactly how much CO2 is emitted by an internal combustion engine vehicle because it's the same every time you fill a tank up. <laughs> There's no change. There's no mystery. It's transparent. It's obvious. What we do know about the emissions associated with manufacturing an EV is those emissions are going up, not down. And I guess it's not me saying this. This is the International Energy Agency, International Monetary Fund, the UN bodies like the, the, this is a geological, if you like, fact that the net new ton of copper or steel or aluminum or molybdenum or zinc are coming from what are called lower grade ores. You'd have to dig up more rock to get the same pound or ton of metals. Digging up more rock means more energy okay, let me, let me, and grinding more rock, yeah, more energy. Let me stop you there one second. You put in one of your papers that you have to move 500,000 pounds of dirt in order to mine enough metals, minerals to make one, one EV battery. Could you just break Correct. that down for me? So the way you sort of think about this is, uh, is you start with the point, the, how big is the fuel tank in an electric vehicle? If it's the one that everybody buys, the, not everybody, the majority that are being purchased, they're about a, about a half a ton or a thousand pounds, the battery, which is a digression, tells you why the electric vehicle uses a lot more aluminum on average than a regular vehicle, because you're trying to offset what used to be an 80 pounds of gasoline with a thousand pound fuel right. tank. So you offset that by more, more aluminum, which also causes a lot of emissions. It's a very energy intensive, emissions intensive metal. And that often is not included in the calculations, by the way. It's just left out and ignored mm -hmm. by some of the analysts. 
so you have a thousand pound battery uh then you look at the various components of the battery it's you know it's copper it's steel and it's aluminum it has lithium of course because it's a lithium ion battery it has cobalt it has far more graphite by the way than it does lithium or any other element it's the most common element sort of uh, and it's a very intensive um, material to get to make all forms of lithium batteries and then then what you do is you chase up the this is all find this is all find outable if you like in the magic google machine you could look up What's the average ore grade for copper? What was it 100 years ago or 10 years ago? What's the average ore grade for aluminum, the ore grade for nickel and, explain, and all the different explain metals? Explain ore grade. That is what? So ore grade, and you know, when I was in my impetuous youth, I worked briefly for a mining company, so I have a certain affection for mining and miners. I like, I like a Canadian uranium, gold, and silver mining company. Uh, ore grade means the percentage of the rock that you found, the ore, the you know, the that contains the stuff you want. So, the richest ore grades in the metals world is iron. Iron can be, you know, you can you can find iron, which is the rock that you're digging up that contains iron, can be twenty percent iron. I mean, it's, so you you could do the math here. That means for a pound of iron, you dig up five pounds of rock. Uh, copper, however, and a lot of the other, other metals are much less common in the Earth's crust. So the average copper ore grade now is well below 1%. So a pound of copper, you have to dig up 100 pounds of rock, and it's declining. So this is true for every metal. The percentage of the rock that's the metal you want, typically the single digits percentages are a fraction of percent. And if it's the rarer metals, the so-called rare earths, even more, which aren't rare, yeah. by the way, they're actually very common. They just, I mean, in the... In the, in the geology of the earth are common, the geography of the earth, they just aren't, they have rare properties. They're called rarest because they're properties, not because of their, but we know where they are. We know how to find them, how to dig them up. You have to dig up lots of dirt. So you have to dig up two kinds of dirt. You have to dig up what's called overburden. You have to get to the ore body. So if you're lucky, it's an open pit mine on the surface. You don't have to dig a lot of, get a lot of dirt out of the way. So you have rocks and dirt you have to get out of the way, dig that up. It's just, it's just waste. Then you dig up the ore and then you're digging up again. If it's a ton of copper, you're digging up, you know, not a hundred tons, right? You're digging over over a hundred tons of ore, which you then have to crush with big energy-consuming machines into powder. You have to crush rocks. Then you have to dissolve the rocks with sulfuric acid. We're dissolving rocks, and the more rock you have to dissolve, the more acids you have to use. The more acids, the more energy to make the acids. The more energy to keep everything clean. I mean, this is this is a beyond obvious do loop of very energy intensive activities and then when you get the refined metal you have to ship it this is a refining process like everything else is separate from the mining then you have to go to the chemical industries that convert the refined metals or chem minerals into the nature of the specific material you need for the battery which is another chemical and energy intensive process it's not, it's not mostly... when you put that all together that's where you, that's where you get this you know not only does it take five hundred thousand pounds of rock extracted for your one battery but all in if you if you measure in oil terms you're going to consume between one and three hundred barrels of oil equivalent in energy to make a battery that can can hold about one barrel of oil equivalent yeah, of energy amazing i looked uh, two points i just want to share with you when I, I don't want to hear you keep talking because i just keep learning so much um these earth moving machines huge yeah. huge huge machines that move all this <laughs> earth you mentioned I looked up, and the average one is 237,000 gallons per year. Yeah. They're 12 feet high that's off right. the ground. These are huge. And that's why I guess, you know, in mining, energy costs <laughs> are such a big factor. You know, uh, you have to move this stuff. And and uh, uh, it just boggles my mind that people do not take this into account. They think it's fairy dust that it comes here. And, and I did, too. I, I have to admit, when I got two of my uh, two Teslas and I traded them, and I thought I was doing something great for the environment— and then now <laughs> every night that I plug it in, I realize that it was zero. It didn't come here by magic. All of the in, the the fuel that was needed to do that. And the second thing I want, I just wanted to touch on for for us, is that most of this refinery uh, is done in China because who the heck wants a refinery in their backyard? Is that right? Yeah. Well, back to your machines. By the way, I'm, I'm, I love these big mining trucks. They're literally the size of a house. These trucks. Huge. The size of a house. They're great. And the idea that we're going to convert those mining trucks to not using diesel in right. the near future. What are they going to do on solar? You know, <laughs> these things are well, huge. You can make them, you, you can run them on batteries too, if you make enough batteries. Uh, but it, it's to say it's impractical to do it is 
a breathtaking understatement. Uh, we're not going to be running these trucks anything other than big diesel generators and, and diesel engines for a very, very long time. And by that, I mean, you know, many, many decades. The machines themselves have a life, uh, useful life of 30 to 40 years. You, you, once you spend millions of dollars, tens of millions to buy a machine, you're going to run it for a long time. But, you know, back to your question about where the refineries are. I mean, so the, they're elsewhere. They're not in America or Europe, uh, by and large. There's some, there's some, not many, uh, very, very few. So what we're doing is we're making an interesting trade, right? The United States in particular is domestically self-sufficient. In fact, in hydrocarbons, we're a net exporter of hydrocarbons, if you count all in. We're, um, we were almost, we were briefly a net exporter of oil and oil products. In 2018, uh, we'll, wasn't it 2018 or so we were a net exporter? Uh, it was 2019, 2020, into that year, we were still, if you count, you know, we still import because there's an arbitrage. You know, you import crew, you export refined products. But we are functionally uh, uh, independent of uh, the need for imports, functionally. You know, I, just remember, um, I just remember back in the 70s during the energy crisis oh, yeah. and going to school there. And it was yeah. always a dream that one day America would be self-sufficient. And we had yeah. OPEC uh, with a gun to our head. And after the uh, uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, when they placed an embargo, the oil was there, but they yeah. wouldn't ship it to us in the United States. Right. Uh, we were... We, we didn't have production. We were way, way behind. And now it seems that we traded off OPEC uh, for China. We're now reliant on China yeah. for refining our, our yeah. metals and and, uh, and lithium batteries. And this whole green energy seems like to be playing into the hands of China. It's, is, am I being a little crazy on that? Or is that those are the facts? No, it's that you're just stating a f let's let's put aside the geopolitical implications. You can just look at the facts first. Right. I mean, the U.S., is a net exporter of hydrocarbons. China is a net importer of hydrocarbons. China has a market share in refining what the IEA, the International Energy Agency, calls energy minerals, the things like copper and lithium carbonate. So the refining of energy minerals, that capacity in China, in terms of global market share, is double OPEC's global market share in oil. So China by itself is the OPEC on steroids of energy minerals for refining. And if you're a reasonable person would say, well, can we do something about that? Can we do something about that? Mm -hmm. Couldn't re reshore those refineries? Of course you can. Uh, you, first you have to want to, you have to put in place the kind of regulatory environment that makes it possible to build them economically. That hasn't happened in any of the legislation by any president, by the way, in uh, in decades. So we don't, have, we don't have the appetite politically to do that. And we're not doing it. Even if tomorrow we decided to do it, the velocity of demand for those minerals, that's mandating batteries be put in cars instead of gas tanks, vastly ex exceeds the velocity with which we could reshore the supply of those minerals. So the mining is elsewhere. You can't open mines easily in America. The, um, the administration last year uh, reversed permits that were millions of dollars and years in development for copper and nickel mines, three of them in the United States, just reversed the permits after the after many years of trying to get the permits in place and passing, you know, passing, passing all the tests, if you like, they, they passed in flying colors, they were failed anyway. So the path that we're on is unequivocally one of increasing dependencies on foreign sources for the primary materials and the refined materials. But we're sort of hiding behind the fig leaf of subsidizing what are called EV factories or battery factories. These are assembly plants, which are still dependent on importing metals and materials and minerals refined elsewhere. So it would be it'd be no different than the, the symmetrical equivalent is what you described going back to the dawns of the uh, the energy embargoes, oil embargoes, is that we were assembling cars in America. And we, in fact, had very few foreign cars sold in America at that time. But we were very dependent on gasoline and oil imports to fuel the cars. So what we're doing now is replicating same model, <laughs> the exact situation same we were in 50 years ago. Yeah. We just replaced, uh, you know, we just placed with refined uh, minerals and metals, and and uh, and and these things, these these, these well, with the lithium, uh, cobalt, I think it was 17 or so of, of, of minerals that we need are none of the friendliest places in the world for us. Well, we're you know. We used to be one of the primary suppliers of many of these metals and minerals. U.S. is, is geophysically rich in all all these metals and minerals, but like you know, there's nothing wrong. I, I, I count me in the 
free trade camp, right? I, I'm happy to trade with other countries. When you get a trade concentration is when you get geopolitical risks and problems. And of course, the risk with China is, uh, is beyond obvious. You don't have to be uh, anti-China or pro-China to, to observe the fact that we're in, we're in economic conflict with them for sure. I hope it stays just an economic. We're certainly in political conflict with them. And so we've handled hand them and they've made this decision 20 years ago. It was public information. Mm -hmm. They published the fact of, of their goal. So we knew what they were planning to do. So now we have this sort of odd balance uh, to, to pick up on what President Biden said and his Secretary of Energy have said, the world's going to use oil for a long time. Another point to make is China is going to be dependent on oil and gas imports for a long time, too. They can't they can't match what we've done in the oil and gas world. They're not anywhere close to it. So they, they actually have a bargaining chip now. I mean, if you think about it in just simple geopolitical terms, they had no bargaining chips. They were very deeply dependent on vital energy imports to keep their economy running. Uh, we, we could we could cause them a lot of pain, uh, both directly and indirectly in the oil and gas market, natural gas markets. Uh, well, you know, they could cause an awful lot of pain to the world as the world increases its dependency on energy minerals to build windmills, solar arrays, and electric batteries. So it's it's not an accidental strategy. It's a, actually, a, actually a brilliant strategy, mm -hmm. especially when you consider they, they now have price control over those energy minerals because they utterly dominate the market far more again far more than OPEC and we we don't have any effective way to offset that price control except to do the equivalent of what we did in the oil and gas industry uh with minerals but turns out that's a lot harder I mean the velocity of opening a mine versus the velocity of getting an oil well in place years, are profoundly years. different they're just the different this is like um to, I mean, to put it very simplistically, it's like the the difference in the velocity of building a uh, a mining truck and building a go kart. I mean, mines are huge; they take decades to to build. Typically, the average in the world is sixteen years to go from discovery to what is it? I, I, to I have, recently heard you speak about a copper mine. How long does it take from start to finish to start to to digging? Was the, sixteen? Or yeah, the average IEA says is sixteen, 16 years, years, but it could be. Could be ten years in some in some mm. jurisdictions if if you're lucky, and it could be thirty and others infinite in the United States apparently. But if you wanted to compare that to the oil and gas world, the the slowest, the most difficult projects in terms of velocity are offshore offshore rigs, offshore oil projects, and uh, one of the most remarkable accelerations that's occurred, sort of un, untold stories, is that that's been cut in half from a decade to five years roughly. But still five years to do a billion dollar offshore oil platform to go into production from you know discovery to production. Uh, shale well from, you know, we don't have to discover shale. We know where it is. We've always known where it is. But the decision, let's say decision to production uh, in a shale well depends on where it is, but six months to a year, it's very, very quick. Uh, so you're looking at velocities in the oil and gas world that are literally 10 times faster than the velocities in the minerals world. And and the minerals world's velocities are all attached to foreign jurisdictions, which are opaque, often corrupt, uh, subject to bribes, it's to, to labor practices that we 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 would when we know about them find offensive. Child labor is rampant in the mining minerals world in Africa and South America. Uh, it's not it's not up to say it's not a nice thing is a breathtaking understatement. That, but it's generally ignored. Uh, as you know, I reviewed a book for the Wall Street Journal re recently called Cobalt Red, in which the author, professor of human trafficking and slavery in England, uh, was pretty pretty gutsy. He he went down to Congo, into eastern Congo, and went visiting the mine sites, which you're not supposed to visit, to try to document the extent to which the cobalt mining in particular is done, what's called this euphemism, artisanally. Yeah. <laughs> which means by hand with a shovel, and how much of that's with children. And of course, he reports that he thinks that the percentage that it's artisanal and, and child labor is vastly higher. The official estimates are, are something like 20% of the mining in in Congo for cobalt is uh, artisanal and, and maybe half that's with children. He thinks it's far higher. But even if it isn't far higher, it's pretty it's pretty grotesque when you think about it. Does that matter? Well, yeah, because uh, as he points out correctly, pretty much every lithium battery and every portable device has cobalt because you need it for the energy density. 
a majority of the world's electric cars still use cobalt. And of course, it, those that don't use cobalt in their batteries, you can you can switch up the chemistries. There's lots of different chemical soups you can use. You use, use typically more nickel, for example. Uh, so you're shifting your demand for one metal to another, which still takes you on the same path of foreign mines, foreign refining, uh, questionable labor practices, all of which in principle can be fixed and made transparent in principle. It's just, it's not there right now. It's not where we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, Sithrat Kara, are you referring to uh, a cobalt red? Uh, I have, yeah. I'm going to have him on the show. He's just fascinating. Read his book. Good. It was just unbelievable what he did uh, exposing. And, and most of those mines in Congo were in partnership with the Chinese. They were there in 08, 09. They saw the, pro they saw the opportunity right there that the world's going to need cobalt in every, every lithium battery, I think it is, uh, cobalt is part of. To, to well, every, every uh, high-performance device lithium battery. But the big, you can, you know, one can make lithium batteries with um, no uh, cobalt at all. There's lithium iron phosphate batteries, there's nickel manganese batteries, there's lots of different chemical formulations. But as you change the chemical mix, you you trade off things like temperature, temperature tolerance, fire safety, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. range. The uh, now favored lithium iron phosphate, which the pioneer, pi pioneered in China, uh, is, is a very clever uh, battery chemistry, very, uh, very safe chemistry, relatively speaking, and uh, safer than the cobalt class batteries. Uh, but it has lower energy density. So you have to yeah. either have a bigger battery to get the range. Which, so instead of a 1,000-pound battery, it's 1,200 pounds, which means more, which which means more, more aluminum, metals. More, more everything you'd be. Yeah, more yeah. copper, more aluminum. Pick, more, pick your poison. Or you have less range, right. and everybody's trying to sell range. So right. in China, you don't have to sell range because there's lots of people without cars. So really small cars with okay range, uh, which is what's going on as a first vehicle with – Arguably, features and safety standards that most Americans won't won't buy, mm -hmm. won't, won't tolerate. Uh, it's a big market for them in China, so it'd be, that'll be true in India. So I expect there's going to be lots more of those cars. In fact, China's export of their electric vehicles, if you track that data, they are they are they have become a powerhouse, uh, and not just producing electric vehicles, but exporting electric cars and vehicles in general. They're not to our, not to us. We're not buying them yet here. I think that'll happen, but to uh, emerging markets, yeah, of I course. I think BYD uh, um, just put a showroom together somewhere in the United States with their electric bus, which looks unbelievable. You know, they're going to get a they foot make, to toehold here. They make, uh, uh, I think, the only, the only, probably the, I would think probably one of the best engineered batteries for a car in the world is still a Tesla. I think Elon Musk uh, focus on this early before everybody else gave him a huge head start. Terrific team. Uh, the engineering is absolutely brilliant. It really is. The level of uh, the energy density and safety and uh, quality on the battery. I'm not talking about the car overall. The car, the car is fine, but it's you know it's not a standout in terms of quality. It's just it's fine. Uh, but the battery is impressive, and the rest of the world is catching up. They'll 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 probably get to pair up a suit with him in due course. And and I would say BYD's batteries. Probably pretty, pretty much on par with uh, Tesla's engineering. Get, getting there, Chinese engineering on this stuff is very good. They've been at it a very long time. Uh, I, I've traveled to China several times. I've been in maybe I think twelve or fourteen Chinese cities. Visited battery factories there and uh, electric car factories and bus factories. This was pre pre epic lockdowns. Of course, I did. Over the last few years, it's a little more difficult lately. He's a friend of mine just went there and told me he was he was put into quarantine ten days anyway, despite negative tests, passports, visas, vaxes. He still had to right. be quarantined. So God, I hope it was a nice hotel. Probably was, and knowing him, it, here here's the thing that's sort of puzzling to me about, uh, and I think it's in people's heads about electric cars. I'll come back to the. So the mythology of this, yeah, there are elsewhere emissions and lots of emissions. Uh, it's el elsewhere dependencies, elsewhere jobs. You know, all, all those things are all true, but there's this sort of uh, naive belief that it's a simpler vehicle. I mean, look, it's just it's a battery and an electric motor. What could be simpler? Look at that. It's got to be inherently cheaper to make eventually. Okay, um, if you thought if that were true, if it were inherently simpler. That might it might be true. It'll be inherently cheaper to make, but it's not true. The battery is not like the little double A cell you stick in a child's toy. This this half ton uh, engine is actually an electrochemical engine, has thousands of parts in it. 
Uh, if it's a Tesla battery, probably tens of thousands of parts, but lots of batteries, thousands of parts, tens of thousands of welds, cooling systems, electronic control systems, structural systems. It's a complicated, multi-thousand part electrochemical engine. The motor is simple. The electric motor has two moving parts. In an internal combustion engine, we just flop the complexities. The fuel tank has two moving parts. It's a electric motor that pumps your fuel, two moving parts, a little tiny one. The tank has nothing in it, it's just, just <laughs> fluid. The engine, on the other hand, instead of being an electrochemical engine with thousands of parts, it's a thermochemical engine with thousands of parts. We, we just swap mechanical, thermomechanical complexity for electrochemical complexities. They, they're both complex, they both wear out, they both wear out at the molecular level. Wear and tear on an engine with the reciprocating parts is literally at the molecular level. It's all batteries wear out. Electrochemistry in them wears out at the molecular level. They both have performance characteristics that that vary with temperature. That vary, you know, all kinds of. They both have safety issues. The difference the difference between them is that the complicated fuel tank in a um, yes. electric car is made of expensive minerals as opposed to cheap iron ore and steel. And the mineral costs that go into a battery constitute about 70 or 80% of the cost to make the battery. So once you know that we now are making batteries so efficiently, in other words, if I took all the labor out, so the labor was free, the capital and the overhead for the automated machines is free, that would still that would reduce the cost of a, a battery by 20, 25%. That's it. It doesn't. It's not game changing. What you're left with is, put differently, is the future cost of batteries for electric cars, which dominates the cost of the electric car, is entirely dependent on the future of the mining industry. So what we're making a bet on when we tell people they won't be able to buy internal combustion engines is a bet that the mining industry will cooperate and provide both enough minerals and metals and cheaply enough to keep consumers happy. The, the, the mining, the mining uh, operations in parts of the world which are not the friendliest to the United States. Well, they're not here. And they're also, I mean, the most important point, of course, is that the cost of these minerals has been rising. So a lot of the um, 2022 price spikes and everything have come off of the highs, including inflation overall. Inflation is still at a 40-year high. In fact, it's a 50-year high, but it's below the peak of last summer. Uh, mineral prices similarly are still at highs. They're about depending on the basket you choose, but the kind of metals that go into batteries and electric cars, nickel, you know, copper, aluminum, they're all about 200% to 300% more expensive than five years ago. Alumin aluminum is, is at, uh, you know, multi-decade highs still. The lithium is still, instead of being 1,800% more expensive, it's only 900% more expensive than it was five years ago. So all of the, all of the minerals and metals are going into making electric vehicles and solar arrays have become more expensive, which is driving up the cost of those machines. So the last year and, two, and this year and next year, batteries are getting more expensive, have got more expensive. Wind turbines are got more expensive, are gonna get more expensive. Same with solar. The pre and all of them have the same characteristic. They all, all depend for their uh, price forecasts on the availability and price of the input minerals and metals. So the, the most important thing that's being missed in all the ambitious plans to make this energy transition is acknowledgement that every one of the plans, there's no exception, all plans in all countries, all the aspirants to this transition, a certain belief that the costs of these machines will get cheaper by, a, not a little bit, by a lot in the future. All of them are asserting and model all of their forecasts on ever declining costs for electric cars, their batteries, windmills and solar arrays. That model, those claims are profoundly and completely dependent on the cost of the metals and minerals. And about that, I would I would take the bet. Those are not going to go down. But I just want to know on what basis they're assuming these things will get cheaper at the rate that they're claiming. That is, put differently, for the battery to go down by 50% in price, electric car battery is about $10,000 to make, roughly. So, for it to become, and that's about what the average price premium is for electric car over a conventional car. This roughly setting aside the really expensive 
high-end cars, which could prize, you know, 5% of the market. We're talking about the cars that people drive every day, the $22,000 uh, Nissan, the $22,000 Toyota. To make that an a, a electric vehicle, you basically increase its cost by eight or $10,000, It the input costs. To get to cost parity, the battery has to be free, essentially. Because internal or, combustion or engines the, don't cost much. the government much. has to give a subsidy. Well, okay, but what's going on, and and uh, we have already seen this is when the government gives the subsidies, the car doesn't get cheaper. The the automaker keeps the price at that, and and they raise the price and extract the benefit for themselves. But but you're right. You in principle you could subsidize it enough to make it cheaper. Sure. It's just then you're. It, I guess the real question is how, what percentage of cars are governments willing to subsidize? 100 percent of them apparently because if we ban internal combustion engines entirely. If, unless unless the internal unless the electric car gets cheaper, then we're going to have to subsidize every car everybody buys. Yeah, but Mark, do we have enough minerals in the world to uh, make these cars? Do we have enough copper to, if, if to, to replace well, one point four million light yeah. vehicles? Bill, I'm sorry, one point yeah. four billion light vehicles throughout the world. Uh, gas yeah. gas powered. So, the the question has to be phrased carefully because there's. For this reason, and this is not to criticize you, Charles, it's, a, it's because the answer to the question, are there enough minerals in the world, is unequivocally yes. Because I've been I've been accused recently of something that was the deepest cut that's ever been leveled against me in my career. I was called a Malthusian for saying that we don't have enough minerals in the uh-huh. world, as if <laughs> I'm, I'm the anti-Malthusian. Anyway, the, uh, there, are, there are enough metals and minerals in the Earth's crust. This is not, in fact, that some researchers recently at MIT put out a study to prove the obvious. There, there are enough minerals in the world to finance all, all cars being electric. Yes, of course there are. That's not the point. Yeah. It's the, the point really implicit in this is are we now mining enough and are the world's mines investing in enough expansion to provide that quantity of copper and aluminum and nickel? And for that, we, ha- we know the answer. And again, courtesy of the International Energy Agency, we want to have to increase the mining of things like copper by nearly 300%, things like uh, lithium by, I think, about 500%, for graphite by about 800% or 1,000%. The, the increase in mining required to meet this uh, are numbers that have never been seen, I mean, literally in modern history. But more importantly, even if you naively thought you could expand mines that fast enough, you you would want to ask the obvious question, are the world's mining industries announcing plans and investments in the coming decade that are even close to what's required? And, you know, there are businesses that follow this stuff. Rystad does, my, you know, there are mining and analysts that follow this stuff. Wood McKenzie has put out very good data on this. Roughly speaking, the world's mining industry is investing about 10% of what's required to meet 2030 goals. 10%. Of what's required, so, or put differently, we're, we're going to miss the we're going to miss the availability of the metals to make enough electric vehicles by 2030 by a factor of 10. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And by the way, just to just to close with this, even if we got rid of all of the 1.4 billion light vehicles on the road today that suck up gas, what are we saving mm-hmm. in the world's fuel consumption? Because, like you said, the the fuel is going to have to go some. We're going to we're going to need yeah. fuel in order to make all these other things. So. What would be the net savings? If you could wave the wand, they would, or which we sort of did with lockdowns. We stopped mm. people from driving as much. If you could wave the wand, you could eliminate about a quarter of the world's oil use if you did it overnight. Uh, no more driving of internal combustion engine vehicles, light duty vehicles, small trucks. Um, and from a viewpoint of overall hydrocarbon use, oil, gas, and coal, Combined, yeah, net number. that's not a 20, you know, your total reduction is about 7% of the world's hydrocarbon use. But remember, it, the wand waving is not happening. We're looking at 20 years. 20 years from now, the increased consumption of oil for the mining machinery, for aviation, for heavy trucks and delivery, shipping, all the other factors would mean that even, even if you could get to 100% electric vehicle penetration 20 years from now, you would eliminate, by my estimation, about 12 to 12 to 15 percent of the world's oil use or uh, at that time so that's something i mean it's you know it's a lot of oil but the more important question that you'd have to ask if you're a strategist or an analyst is who's producing the other 80 to 90 percent where's it coming from uh, do who, who's investing in that well we know opec is russia 
will continue to do that. Uh, China's investing in oil and gas expansion in their country yeah. and offshore. We have it on we their have, shores. I, I saw the last eight quarters. On average, the uh, U.S. oil industry has not been uh, spending in due to build the uh, administration and, and political risk into, uh, into capital expenditures, into drilling. So it's eight quarters. So our supply is greatly lagged. And suppose you guys put the, put a big frame around this. We're talking about a hundred million barrels a day is what the what we're sucking up, yep. right? So even uh, if I take the, the world consumes a hundred million barrels a day. So even thirty years, let's say twenty years out. So with 10% reduction, we're still going to be using 90 million barrels or so a day yeah. at the best. Yeah. But who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll 80%, 80, 80 million. Well, it, it's it's not zero. Anyone <clears throat> who thinks it's zero uh, is... Well, that's the problem. Even if you even if you uh, imagine a scenario as wildly optimistic as you get to all... The bands are... In effect, the electric cars are at, at price parity or subsidized to be a price parity, and you get, you get rid of 20 million barrels per day of oil. Uh, you still have to produce at least 80 if nothing else grows and since other things will grow you're still going to have to produce closer to 90 million barrels per day so the question that's important because it's only 20 years away that we're going to force this quote transition it's it's back to where we started this is not a transition right this this is not a transition away from oil use this it's a reduction in oil use even if it were to happen but it's not a transition away from the need for hydrocarbons and to, to make it apolitical, to your point of, under this administration's hostility to oil and gas, which has been moderated by the president's intemperate off, off script remarks. And, you know, OK, I'll give him credit for, for, for doing it because he had to have been realizing as soon as he sa started saying it, what he was saying. He's not whatever other people think. He's, he, he's you know, he's pretty aware of what he's saying. He may he may have um, loose lips, but a lot of presidents have had loose lips and when they're talking. Here's, here's the thing is that you, it, it's not just under this presidency or the previous presidency where it was much more enthusiastic about oil and gas. But if we look at the global oil and gas industry, so we get out of the United States and we look at the behaviors of capital markets broadly, where the investments uh, come from, both both the uh, private markets, private banks, and and public banks, if you like, the, the international banking system, especially the European banking system. It's been hostile to oil and gas investment for about 15 years. And so if we charted the total capital expenditures of the oil and gas industry globally in new production, it started started going down like it like a, off a cliff 15 years ago. And then when COVID hit, and then this president was elected, the combination it accelerated down. So we're, we're now at epic lows that began, predates US, US lack of enthusiasm, let's call it. And, and let's give the administration credit for, for uh, giving a permit to ConocoPhillips for drilling on the, in, in Alaska, even though the jury is out as whether or not they've also put it into place we'll call it the expedited rules or at least uh, arbitration rules so that they can get it built as quickly as they built the original uh, you know, oil production in Alaska. So they don't, it's just, it'll never get built I, under I, litigation. So that you bring in 180,000 barrels uh, when that's up and running? It's huge, it's, it's, but it's a huge, huge, it's a huge fine, right? I mean, a, a really, a really productive um, uh, shale well, you know, that's, that's like putting a um, couple hundred really productive shale wells in place all at once. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal when they get, when they get it, when they get it going. So we have this general antipathy in the investment world, private and public, and a lot of social and public pressure, a lot of overt pressure not to invest net new money in oil and gas globally. And it's had the effect that was intended. The investment's gone down. It's had it's had the effect. And the fact that sort of everybody knows if you're an analyst, but it's you don't have to understand the oil and gas industry to, to, to know this important fact. You have to, just like food, right, you have to plant crops every year. In the oil and gas business, when you consume energy from oil from a well or gas, the the well eventually has exhausted its its capacity. So you have to plant new. The exploration each year in development is the equivalent of planting planting new food each year. And we know the decline rate, the global decline rate for all the world's oil wells. If we if we stopped investing in new ones tomorrow, went to zero, we, every year we'd have about six or seven million barrels per day less oil available to the world. So or put differently, we we have to find and put into production uh, oil output pretty close to what Texas does every year. 
So, so globally, so you without without making a prediction because I know that's not what you're doing. I, I hate predictions because they're not- well, I episodically get into the game. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Oh, predicting. Yeah. I, I I get trapped into and have to make predictions occasionally. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> this is this is simple economics 101. Supply is shrinking and being crimped yeah. and not yeah. being replaced, even at the rate of 7 million barrels a, a year. We're consuming, even yeah. if we stay at 100 million, but we know that's not the case. China is reopening. India, other development countries want the same benefits we all have as electricity 24-7 or the availability of that. No brownouts in that. Even if that stays the same. We're in a situation the way I see it, where five years or so from now, how could oil prices not be higher? Yeah, I think if, if you know, the thing about oil prices is the if you're really good at predicting them, especially in the mid short term, you're a very you're a very wealthy person, as we all know. It's true for all commodities. So com- commodities are impacted by lots of variables, but with oil, it's easy. Uh, oil is still utterly deeply tied to our economy, first of all, since just to, to state an obvious fact, 90, 98% of all the world's movement of goods and people is, is moved by burning oil, 98%. And if you get all the EVs to happen uh, in the next 20 years, so maybe you get maybe you get it down to 90%, right? So the world moves people and goods, things that we need and things we want by burning oil. So if you, if you have a recession, uh, people move less and buy less stuff. Uh, so you're, you're reduced to, in simplistic terms, moving only the essentials, food, right? And things you have to have and have to replace. You just put everything off. So a, a really deep recession can really, really put off the day of reckoning. Uh, and I think we're on track for a recession. I'm not a great predictor of things, but you know, given in, inflation and interest rates and market psychology and the banking challenges, it sort of feels like we're already in a, a mild recession, at least. The world doesn't like recessions. The world always comes out of recessions, even the Great Depression. We came out of it eventually. So the bet you're making, to your point, is when whatever the recession is, however long we de- delay the oil-consuming impact of growth again, because all growth, including EV enthusiastic world, will result in more, more oil demand, not less. For the near future, let's forget whether we're going to 20 or 30 years. So the for the near, five, for the near years, five years. Five years or so. Yeah, five, 10 year future. So this is what you would look at. You'd look at the decline curve and the investment numbers. And those are two public numbers. The decline curve, we know, the investment's down. So we know for a fact that a, a day in the in, in the not distant future could be 18 months, could be as soon as 18 months, could be, could be. If we dodge a really bad recession, so if, it could if happen. If it's a geopolitical it, event, it could be even sooner. So, who knows? Well, right? here, can I give you? Can I give you a scenario? Here's a here's a, an optimist scenario with a pessimistic outcome. Peace breaks out in Ukraine, and um, Putin leaves office. Doesn't have a heart attack. He retires. He's deposed. Whatever. So that Russia gets out of the penalty box. And, and the world wants to buy its oil and gas again. Here's here's a factor that's not being threaded into the discussion about future oil prices. Russia is uh, one of the world's biggest oil exporters. They export 7 million barrels per day. They export much more than we do. They're, they, they are like OPEC, the big dogs in oil export. But their oil is being sold at about a 40% discount to market because they're in the penalty box. We sanctioned them, so everybody else is buying a discount. If you're, you don't have to again be a, an oil trader or an, an economist to know if, for the first time in history, the the biggest one of the biggest exporters of a commodity to the world market, as having to sell its stuff for at forty percent off of prevailing price, that has dragged the world price down. If you add to that a mild recession, which is what we're where we're sitting, if you get growth, so growth will come back if peace breaks out in part because people will be enthusiastic, the animal spirits, all which would be great. Let's pray, G negotiates a peace, pray that Putin is, you know, exits the world stage in some some fashion that we're all comfortable with, <laughs> whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And oil demand goes up and they start trading oil in the market again. Uh, wow. At, at, uh, at you, the real price. It just do do the math here. Yeah. I mean, take take 7 million barrels per day, which gets you to sort of a, uh, a what's that, about 3 billion barrels of oil a year going at a discount of about 30 to $40 a barrel. So there's a $100 billion a year discount in oil going on now it's reflected that's because reflected of in the current price Putin. right that's reflected yeah. in the current I mean, price yeah it's, it's i mean it, 
it's I mean, you could argue it's a good thing that there's less money flowing to, to potentates who sell oil, including Putin. Um, we're doing fine. You know, Miss record profits for Exxon and the shale guys are, are making a lot of money at these prices. But the bigger economic and political question and the one that ought to scare politicians witless is growth comes back and peace breaks out. Uh, what we don't want, and this is what I think um, Chairman Powell knows, by the way, I think he's a very smart guy. When he answered uh, a question that he was put, you know, put to him last week in Senate hearings about inflation and the tool he has, which is interest rates, it, we're talking about what the other things are that might push inflation. Well, the Federal Reserve has published pretty good academic papers on the other things like systemic increase in commodity prices, oh, yeah. not, not an episodic increase. If you push oil back to $100 a barrel and leave it there for, I don't know, four or five years instead of instead of four or five months, I mean, this is inflationary. Uh, if it's high enough, it creates recessions by itself. This is uh, this is I when mean, we had our high, high oil prices. It acts like a tax on the American people. Yeah. Dri it is a tax driving America. your car. You have to now figure out if I'm traveling 50 miles a day to work. It's going to cost you X percent more. And I remember back last year in February time when, when we were, there were calculations that I don't remember ever thinking about and hearing about that I heard in the 70s of, well, I only yeah. could fill up today and here's what it cost. All of a sudden, energy yeah. became a big factor. And I'm, I'm in New York and I'm seeing what my gas bills are, uh, my, my uh, natural gas bill. Uh, each month and my electric bill they've gone through the roof yeah. and this is at a discounted price of crude oil mm -hmm. amazing yeah. so let's use, let's use the language that, that that everybody now understands if they read papers systemic risk right that when you have policies that create quote systemic risk so what did we what did we do with a with a policy of of zero percent money we created an infl a systemic risk inflation when you in inflate the cost of money you have a systemic risk and you end up with bank bank failures so we we understand the the what the the the, the bludgeoning of markets with ham-handed tools that have systemic impacts create systemic risks so let me just use that language when you when you create an environment in which the world is under investing in its primary source of moving goods and, and people oil You've created a systemic risk, yeah. and that systemic uh, risk is calculable. We we know we have lots of data, just like in the financial markets, on what happens if you create an environment in which the market's demand for oil exceeds its supply. Systemically, not because there's a brief war in it's the Middle East, or, it's not but this is this is this is a long term trend, and that's what I've been going over my numbers and looking at this for the past year, and I'm saying to myself, how could oil not be higher? Five years from now, and and I'm glad uh, I'm glad you just laid out the facts. Uh, uh, Mark, I'm glad to have you on again. I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours, folks. Mark Mills, the name of his latest book, really definitely worth reading. Uh, even though it's, it's, let me just say the name of it: The Cloud Revolution: How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom in a Roaring 2020s. Is a fantastic. I think about six or seventy pages there about energy, right? And that yep. book, yeah, really great stuff. Yeah, uh, well worth Thank well you. worth reading. Um, and, and I think it's uh, uh, really, really uh, enlightening because you, you you go into research that no one ever, everyone talks about, but no one thinks about. I appreciate that. I mean, I'm, you know, I guess the reason I'm frustrated at us uh, creating systemic risk of high cost energy is that we're sitting on the cusp, as, as I try to outline in my book, as you know, of one of the greatest economic expansion opportunities in, in, in a century. Yeah. Yeah. And, and growth brings energy demand. If you make energy expensive, you constrain the growth. You won't, it, It's not that it will never happen, is that you push it off in time. And of course, we all know time value of money matters. I mean, if somebody tells you, I'm going to give you a raise in 10 years, you're not as happy as getting getting a smaller raise tomorrow. Amazing. <laughs> For obvious Amazing. reasons. All right, Mark, I want to thank you once again, man. Best of luck to you. And uh, keep doing the great work that you do. You uh I follow you uh, when, you, when you're when you speaking on YouTube. Uh, you write tons of papers and uh, really amazing stuff. Keep going for the next 20 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Good to be good to be on. And I'm, as you know, my podcast is The Last Optimist. I'm, I'm still a stubborn optimist. Oh, yeah. The Last Optimist, by the way, folks, definitely worth <laughs> listening to. Mark, thanks so much. Um, thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, 
We'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.